All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the this is the 18th day of June in the year of our Lord 2022. And this is the second video. Because the uh, church news portion that was only supposed to take a few minutes as usual took about 50 minutes. Dealing with two stories. The church is indeed in tribulation and apostasy and judgment is upon the world, especially the West. You can look forward to probably a coming Great Depression. Of course, as I did complete my thought, but Marie Antoinette let them eat cake, the Biden administration. Gas too expensive? Well, get an electric car. Yeah, everybody's going to go out and buy a Tesla. The Democrats, the the defenders and uh, the the patrons of the poor, just go buy a Tesla. Really? You know, you could probably make an inexpensive electric car. But you'd have to strip it of all the government mandates. You know, like uh, something small, light, utility vehicle that would do 50 miles an hour. Make it as, you know. But uh, forget the airbags, forget all the extra junk. Give it the essentials, you know, electric Model T, for example, in concept. Inexpensive. But you have to realize batteries have limited lifespans. See, the smaller and lighter the vehicle, the less electricity it takes to charge it up, too. But that's not what the government will do. The government always ruins everything they touch including justice because they're sinners and it, now it's gotten so bad that unbelievable unbelievable let them eat cake let them buy an electric car let them buy a tesla can't afford gasoline you're poor you can't afford gasoline Nancy says, if you can't afford gasoline, get a Tesla. Get an electric car. You can't build inexpensive vehicles anymore. They won't allow it. Remember the Chevrolet Chevette? They were some of the nicest cars. And they had the little Chevrolet Chevette diesel, little Isuzu diesel in there. They'd get like 50 miles to a gallon. Of course, they were a bear trying to accelerate up to internet speed, uh, to, uh, interstate speed. Well, you can slow the interstates down to 50 miles an hour. Here, you start using the trains again for moving stuff instead of trucks. See, we have a society... That, that is that its own corruption, the side effects of sinful corruption, uh, the, the love of money, the love of riches, the desire to maximize profit, uh, with no, see, there's no moral guidance in America. There's no moral guidance in the free market in America. 
and there's certainly no moral guidance in Congress. So you need to, to, to allocate resources wisely, and the free market just wastes everything. It's, it's not good. Uh, an on an unregulated free market. Now, socialism results in huge amounts of waste too, because you got sinners allocating the resources. The Soviet Union and Eastern Europe was an environmental disaster because of sinful leadership. They, they did not. They were not regulated by God. They were godless. So is the United States today, and that's what we're seeing. So is most of the churches today, godless. They do not subject themselves to the rule of God. The United Methodists are not under the lordship of Christ. They mock him. They're an abomination in his sight, uh, which is... Related to what I want to talk about, this Sunday will be Father's Day. I, I found out oh, more, I guess, two weeks ago and then last week that the church I attend was going to do a Father's Day breakfast in lieu of their worship service. Do the Father's Day thing and then... Uh, bring food and stuff, and then, you know, have a devotion. Well, I decided I don't want to attend that. See, one of the problems that leads to the shipwreck of churches and denominations is failure to, to maintain the holiness of purpose the holiness of the assembly of the saints, the purpose of the assembly of the saints, which is Christ. And what happens quite naturally, quite innocently, put quotes around that, is that people have good ideas. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if? Wouldn't it be nice if we could do this and, or if we did that? And they take their cues from the world. They do not go and ask Christ, should we do this? They don't even think to do that. So it just happens quite innocently, if you want to say that. Good intentions. Well, it's good intentions. It can't be bad, right? Yes, it can. This world, this nation, is strewn with the ruins of churches, sometimes physical ruins, that decided to do what they thought was good in their own sight, rather than what God says is right, and not limiting themselves to God's purposes. Rick Warren does not believe that the church is the assembly of the saints. He believes it's a building to gather sinners in. It's, he believes it's a place for evangelism. Well, he doesn't actually have a gospel, so I don't think that's <clears throat> a valid purpose. Or a hospital. You hear the church is a hospital for sinners. No, it's not. The church, the assembly of the church, is the assembly of the saints. And if you make it into something else, it is not the Church of Jesus Christ. So this little local assembly I attend is a Nazarene church. And the Nazarenes are in a precipitous slide right now. Uh, locally here, the, the destruction is evident. The, 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 they're actually following the Rick Warren idea of re doing the churches in order to attract sinners uh, called seeker sensitive rick warren if you in his book his first book the purpose driven church uh, 
he goes into you know how he built Saddleback is you go out first of all you find a appropriate community a yuppie community young upwardly mobile professionals money 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 so you want to build a big church you got to have people with money or the and we'll have money in the future even more money in the future young people Upward with the mobile professionals. None of this riffraff from the bad side of town. That's one of the reasons I attend this one little Nazarene church, because they were definitely from the bad side of town. Well, actually, they were out of town. They were from the coal mining area here. And as you drive up to the church, you're treated to a good dose of poverty. I'll tell you that. But uh, <clears throat> this is not, I don't live in a wealthy neighborhood. This is a coal mining community, except the coal's gone now. The, the backside of this little community was part of the big, it was the strip mining operation around here, where they used to load the, trail, the rail cars from the, the trucks. It's now a junkyard. But when churches, there's an, I'll give you an example of a local church, Independent Fundamental Baptist, supposedly church, in this area. I'll leave them nameless. Country church, moderately sized, you know, maybe a hundred some in attendance usually. Uh, they, I don't know, maybe they have 150, 200 members, and. Uh, uh, they had built a new building not too long ago. And just, just out in the middle, of, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And then the opportunity to, come, to get some land next to the adjacent to the church came up and other things. And what they've done, they had too much money. They had too much money. So they bought this, as these things became available under the leadership of the current pastor, I believe. Uh, I don't know if the previous one had, had done any of this either, but they they, they uh, bought this land and then they ended up building a big gym in a separate building that's actually not even adjacent to the church building. Built a big gym and a missionary housing and quarters upstairs and... And all kinds of things. These dreams. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if? And next to it, there's a, a playground. I mean, with all nice, fancy playground equipment for the kids. And a little park area. I noticed another church that has something like this. But it's like this is overdone. And it's a much smaller church. And then they put in a ball field. I mean, a nice ball field. A fenced ball field. And they bought these acres of land of land that was right next to the church property, and they had to do something with it. So they got the they had to you put this to use to the glory of God. But this was not God's glory at all. It was just doing what was right in their own sight. That's you know in the military they call that mission creep. You forget your purpose, and you do what you want to do. So what does Jesus Christ have to do with baseball? What does Jesus Christ have to do with gymnasiums? Think of all the activities that churches engage in that have nothing to do with Jesus. But are just things that people want. The music, is it about worshiping Jesus? Is it about edifying the church? Or is it because people like it? There are Nazarene churches in this area. Fortunately, not the one I attend. If, if they did it there, I would not attend it. Who are apparently have followed the Rick Warren model now. It seems to be something that the denomination must have pushed, or at least the the district here, because the majority of churches have done that now. They've spent huge amounts of money remodeling their churches to make them acceptable to the world, to make them look like 
nightclubs and theaters. Perfectly good buildings. Uh, spent huge amounts of the people's money. Wasted. On trying to make themselves attractive to the world. True church, the presence of the Holy Spirit, will never be attractive to the world. They will flee from it. They will flee from God. They've been doing that for 6,000 years. And these churches that have gone this way are ruins. They're on the rocks. They have run aground and destroyed themselves. They have nothing to offer because they don't know what the gospel is. They've lost it. Just like Rick Warren never knew what the gospel was. So as Southern Baptists, they're shipwrecked and many others. The Methodists, United Methodists, shipwrecked. Following the world. And it can be in such a small thing. Is there anything sinful about baseball? Not necessarily. But when a church decides that, that they're going to take what's supposed to be offerings for the purpose of the Lord's work and build a baseball field, oh, we'll have fellowship with other churches by playing baseball. What business does the church, the Assembly of Jesus Christ, even have having a baseball team? That has nothing to do with him. I don't find any instructions in this book about organizing baseball teams. What about people that don't like baseball? Well, they're out. So you're going to take the offerings, and th this is where congregationalism goes really bad, and they think it's a democracy, and decide, well, we well, we got a majority of people that want to do this and that. we got too much money. we got to spend it. I would say taking offerings from, talk about stealing from God. Taking what is given. Oh, we got too much money in the account. What are we going to do with it? Well, let's buy that land. What are we going to do with the land? Well, let's put a baseball field in and put a gymnasium on it and do all these things. And then the, the children will come. The children will come. No, they won't. Or get the children to come. Then their parents will come. Not if they're wicked. They've got to be saved by God. Then they'll want to come, but they won't want to come to your church because it's not godly. They don't want to come to play baseball. Christians don't want to go to the Assembly of the Saints to play baseball or to celebrate Father's Day. This is the issue. So you've got something that, that is a, outwardly in appearance, perhaps wholesome, like Father's Day or Mother's Day. And rather than the church having a fellowship, a fellowship meal once a month or whatever, once every, or, you know, once a quarter, whatever they do, based on the fellowship we have in Christ, which is the only fellowship we do have, they they decide to to follow the world and say, okay, it's Father's Day, let's have a Father's Day event for the men, and let's invite the women too. I'm not interested. I don't care about Father's Day. It was invented in 1908 by some woman who thought it was a good idea and spread it around and, and saw, had campaigned to get it done. And Congress, what politician's going to vote against that? It's like Mother's Day. I think it started in the same year or about that. What politician is going to vote against Mother's Day? It ain't going to happen. And what the problem is, who is there is, is there in churches that are halfway decent that will stand up and say, hey, brothers and sisters, this isn't a great idea. So 
I'm not going to attend tomorrow. Uh, but I do think, as I've been thinking about this, that, that next Sunday, perhaps before the assembly actually commences, I might stand up and say, oh, I imagine some of you are wondering why we were not here last week. I don't want to make a big fuss over it, but this is a, the danger of this this drip, drip, drip of following the world, that we live in a sinful world and we live in bodies that are still sinful. The, the sin dwells in our mortal bodies. And there's always this pull toward the world, toward conformity, toward society, especially for Christians what might appear to be okay in society like Mother's Day or Father's Day but people are unwilling to ask what does God say about this well the, God does say something about Ten Commandments honor your father and mother but the idea of honoring your father and mother one day a year is unbiblical and commercializing that so people will feel guilty if they don't spend money and cards and everything else it's sinful. America turns everything into dung. The love of money corrupts everything. It just, in this society here, it's all about money. So much of things. Government's thoroughly corrupted. Churches are corrupted. The, the very idea that, you know, well, we think, I think it'd be, wouldn't it be nice if, I mean, there was a movement back in, around the beginning of the 20th century. That genre. You had the, uh, um, actually, late 19th century, too. You had, like, the YMCA the, and the, uh, the YWCA, which were originally Young Men's Christian Association. What do they have to do with Christ now? Nothing. Nothing. See, when people just like Southern Baptists, they've gone the same way. All denominations which are unbiblical, denominations are unbiblical, they all go the same way because it's the way of the flesh. And the, the, uh, the things that appear good and wholesome, wouldn't this be a good idea? And are easily, to, you know, we can justify it in the name of, of bringing the gospel to the world. It's like the sinner-sensitive church. I mean, seeker-sensitive church. Which is really the sinner-sensitive church. Because you, you don't want to offend sinners. So which means you cannot preach about sin and judgment and holiness and repentance and salvation. Because that offends sinners. See, you cannot preach about sins, the sins that are so prevalent and supported in this country, in a sinner-sensitive church. Because the whole purpose is to bring sinners in. But once you got them there, in order to keep them there, you can't offend them. So you can't preach Christ. And you can't have the Holy Spirit present because he will convict them of their sins and of righteousness and of judgment and he will drive them out of the building. And it starts small. I'm thinking about reminding that church, my church, not formally a member because I can't be because, well, they're Nazarenes and I'm not. They've got a rule book that I don't accept as biblical. Uh, nor do I accept the authority of the denomination. I don't care what the district superintendent in Chicago thinks. I mean, as far as authority over me. And I'm not going to give any authority over me to him because I've seen what they're doing and I don't like it, and I don't think Christ likes it either, because they're going sinner-sensitive. You know, two of the largest Nazarene churches in the Dan in Danville area here, back during the heyday of the Purpose Driven Life and 40 Days of Purpose, there was a database online of the churches that had participated in that. Their names were on that database. 
Nazarenes. You'd think they'd know better. Apparently not. But they're on the rocks now. They're on the rocks. Because they've forgotten. They have not maintained the holiness of the assembly of the saints. I'm not talking about rules. I'm talking about purpose. It's Christ. Christ is the center. Christ is the purpose. Christ is the end. Everything is from him and to him and for him. That's what the scripture says. He is everything. And when we divert from that, when we don't assemble in his name for his purpose, to honor, worship him, and to edify one another in him for his purpose and knowledge of him, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, we have lost our purpose. We have not maintained the holiness of the purpose of the assembly of the saints, which is Christ himself. And that leads to spiritual shipwreck. That is why the Methodists are now producing hymns to the glory of the queer rather than to the glory of the Christ. Some people may think I'm persnickety. But I can think of one old saint in that church is probably going to say amen if I say anything. I don't want to make a big fuss because sometimes the small things, you know, it's, it's easier for people to poo-poo the small things. The spiritually minded people and people that, that know, they'll, they'll recognize that you know, this is, you know, uh, the, the wrong road starts at the intersection. It only takes a little deviation at the beginning to end up in a really wrong place. And the wisdom comes, I guess, the discernment from Christ comes at the beginning when the Holy Spirit says, don't take that road. And I look at at that when when a church does a seemingly minor thing and it is minor you know how many churches have a special event or special worship times or specially shortened worship times for super bowl sunday that disgusts me how much more does it disgust christ when the super bowl takes priority over the son of god Oh, it's only one day. It's only a little. Uh, people won't show up for church because of the Super Bowl if we don't change the hours. Leave them. Let the dead bury the dead, Jesus said. If the Super Bowl is more important to them than Christ. Now, of course, the church service might not be worth attending anyway. What is going to happen to them on Judgment Day? See, that's the issue. If we actually love the lost and care about them, then it's important for us to maintain the holiness of the assembly of the saints. The separation from the world. Because the world has nothing for them to save them. We cannot be the light of the world when we're wallowing in the mire by that mixture of dirt and poo and urine. If you've ever raised hogs, you know what the mire is. I know what the mire is. You cannot save the pigs by wallowing in the mire. You 
You can't, to be like the world is to be useless for the kingdom of God. You cannot be the light of the world when you're covered with the mire of the world. The purpose is not to look like them and smell like them and act like them. The purpose ought to be to look like Christ and to have the aroma of Christ, the aroma of life, and to act like Christ. When Christ is not all in all, especially in the assembly of the saints, we spend the rest of the week in the world. The saints have to get together, assemble with Christ, because let us remember, the scripture says, where two or more are assembled together in my name, there I am in their midst. Christ is present among his saints in a special way when his saints assemble together in his name. That's in his purposes. For his purpose to be with him. And I don't know if you can find many preachers today in America that know that. And it takes a miracle from God. And maybe a good dose of tribulation to bring us back to what we're supposed to do. Maybe God will have to strip all our luxuries and all our riches from us before we realize where true wealth is found. Before we can have anything worth listening to to say to this world. So I won't be at church tomorrow morning because I do not wish to... I don't wish want to make a loud bunch of noise about it, but I do not wish to give the appearance that I approve of mixing things together, mixing the assembly of the Lord with the things of this world, like Mother's Day or Father's Day or Super Bowl Day or baseball or those things. God calls us to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, that which is precious and that which is common. And churches that fail to do that lose what is holy and what is precious. They forfeit Christ and his presence. That's a road we must not take. Because once you begin going down that road, it's a downgrade. And it is, becomes more and more difficult to stop and turn around and go back. Best not to start down that road at all.